So we have the Gospel of Mark for beginners. This is lesson number two, entitled Jesus the Divine. And uh, we're actually getting into the text. Let me do just a little bit of review here from what we talked about last time. We said uh, last time that the text of Mark divided into three main sections, very easy to diagram. Chapter one, verses one to 13, the introduction of Jesus as the divine Messiah. Chapter 114, all the way to chapter 8, verse 26, Jesus proves His divinity through His teachings and miracles. And then section three is chapter 8, verse 27 to 16, verse 20, Jesus proves His divinity through His death, burial, and resurrection. So a very simple um, division of the uh, book of Mark. Simple, straightforward book, uh, whose only purpose is to present Jesus as the divine Son of God, and then present you with a decision based on this truth. It's a very evangelistic type of book, the book of Mark. All right, so let's begin with the introduction of Jesus uh, Himself, chapter one, verse one. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Boy, Mark doesn't mince any words, does he? He gets right to the point in verse Number one, it's like a, the statement of a premise. He starts with his premise. This is the premise and now I'm going to kind of go ahead and prove the premise. So let's keep reading verse two and three. It says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So here you have the link with the Old Testament, but notice, unlike Matthew, it's very short. Matthew has passage after passage after passage showing you know, Jesus you know, was spoken of in the Old Testament. Mark, one verse. This Jesus, he says, is the Messiah uh, predicted by the Jewish prophets of old or spoken by the Jewish prophets of old. He comes from and he comes through this particular people. And so these verses help the readers kind of get a historical and cultural fix on who and where uh, this Jesus comes from. You know, imagine two verses. We state the premise, Jesus the divine Son of God, <laughs> verse two and three. He comes from, he's, he, the, the Jewish prophets have spoken uh, of him. He's the fulfillment of their prophecy. And so in the Old Testament, the prophets were the ones who preached and spoke of him to prepare the way and also to prepare the people for His eventual coming. Keep reading, verse four, five. Says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and all of the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild Honey. So Mark links these Old Testament prophets to a character in their own generation, a person they may have heard of. The people reading this back in those days may have heard of John the Baptist. And so what Mark is doing here, he's saying the prophets said that before the Messiah would come, there would be a forerunner, a, a person who would come before him to announce that the arrival of the Messiah um, was imminent. And so Mark says that this prophecy was fulfilled when John the Baptist arrived on the scene and began to preach. He dressed like the, de uh, the uh, desert prophets of old. He lived and worked from the desert. He preached a message of repentance and preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Verse seven and eight. And he was preaching and saying, after me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, John baptized with water those who repented, those who heard his message. And through water baptism, or through the water baptism of John, God transferred forgiveness. And so, you know, theologically here, Mark is saying that God offered forgiveness to all who received John's baptism. 
and, and, and the idea was that if they came to John and his baptism, they were getting ready. They believed the message that the kingdom was imminent and they were getting ready for it by doing this, this act. Okay? Um, now somebody may say, well, but Jesus didn't die yet. You know, how are their sins forgiven? Well, you know, we've used this expression, the sins were sent forward. You know, their sins were sent. Were they, were they atoned for yet? Well, no, Jesus didn't die. But through faith, they understood that their sins were you know, kind of moving forward until the day uh, when Jesus would ultimately uh, die for them. Uh, Mark also says that when Jesus would come, He would transfer other blessings, not just the forgiveness of sins, but other blessings. But He would transfer them not through water, but through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So forgiveness and the Holy Spirit was received through water baptism. We know that, Acts 2.38, right? But the power to overcome sin, in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, or the power to do miracles, in Acts chapter 19, verse 6, or the power to minister, 1 Corinthians 2.11, or the power to resurrect and live eternally, Romans 8.11, all of these things are transferred to us through the Holy Spirit, not through water baptism, see what I'm saying? And so you know, Mark is really making a distinction here. He says, yeah, John came, John did a good thing, John was explaining to you know, get ready uh, for the Messiah, people were being baptized uh, with water, and that of course signified their faith, their sins were forgiven, but there was much more to come the things that I've just mentioned, and the things to come would be transferred through the Holy Spirit, not through the water baptism. So um, Jesus immerses or baptizes with the Holy Spirit. How does He do that? Well, He does that by preaching the word to us. You know, we're immersed in His word, John 6, 60, 63. And uh, how else does He give us the Spirit? Well, He sends Him to dwell within us. Acts 2.38, and He seals us, guarantees us with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. I'm not reading those passages, I'm merely referring to them. I just want to stay in Mark. So if, as far as Mark is concerned, you know, just one verse, but what he says in that verse is quite significant later on. When people look back, they see that what he's saying is quite significant. So now we go to verse uh, nine and 10. It says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening up and the spirit like a dove descending um, upon him. <clears throat> so the question is, why was Jesus baptized? You know, in Matthew chapter three, verses 13 to 15, uh, in Matthew it says, or Jesus is saying, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So John the Baptist had to baptize all of those who were preparing for the kingdom of God and separate them from their sins. So Jesus comes along and He's baptized. Well, you know what, you know, why is He baptized? Well, Jesus is making His entry on the world scene in order to establish His kingdom. And so his baptism was in connection with the kingdom, not to separate him from sin, he had no sin, but rather his separation from his family, his separation from the world, his separation ready to do the work of God and to pursue his ministry. So his baptism signifies the beginning of his public ministry and the end of his private life. Now his baptism legitimizes and blesses every one of John's baptisms as well, because John is promising when the Messiah comes, he's going to baptize with the Spirit, and so what happens? The Messiah does come, the Messiah is baptized like a good Jew, but then there is the witness of the Spirit about Jesus' baptism, which then confirms everything that Mark was saying, or that John was saying would happen in the future when the Messiah uh, would come. So verse 11, and a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved son and you 
I am well pleased. So John you know, pointed to Jesus as the one who was spoken of, the one who was to come. Now the Godhead itself bears witness to this. All of the Godhead is represented here. The Father speaks. He calls the Son beloved because of who He is and what He will do and how it will affect others. The Son is incarnate, meaning He is visible as a Jewish man and the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. It's the only time in the Bible that all three appear and are manifested at the same time and in the same place. Very unique moment, the baptism of Jesus. And why wouldn't it be? I mean, you know, he's stepping forward. This is his introduction. You, know, you go to a show and they introduce the, so the star of the show, the band is playing, lots of fanfare, the lights are flashing, right? A big, a, big, a big introduction. Well, this is a pretty big introduction. The Godhead is present in, in, in visible form. Verse 12 and 13. And by the way, this, you know, if you're wondering what kind of study is this? Well, this is a textual study of Mark, line by line, verse by verse. I'm going to cover every single verse until the end. That's why I'm reading all of them and we're kind of moving through it. And that's why I'm saying to you, read ahead, read ahead. You know, it's not a long book. You'll be familiar with the material. So verse 12 and 13, it says, immediately the Spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels uh, were ministering uh, to him. So the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Uh, Matthew chapter four, verse one, tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert 40 days, 40 nights, in order to be tempted by the devil. And in Luke chapter 4 verse 1 2, Luke says that he was continually tempted while there for 40 days and 40. It's not like you know, he was kind of hanging around for 40 days and 40 nights and then on the last day Satan shows up. You know? No, no. He, he was continually tested, if you wish, for the 40 days and the 40 nights. We get a glimpse here, you know, a glimpse of part of uh, what he uh, experience. So we have a record of the temptations, but the full impact came as Satan continued to tempt him as time wore on. You know, they talk about the wild beasts. The wild beasts uh, could be the evil spirits. Now, we have to understand the word tempt means many things. Um, it can mean, you know, in, in the way that it's written, it can mean to test or to examine. So to, um, to tempt doesn't only mean to seduce, okay? The word in the Greek does not just mean to seduce someone. Because when you're seducing someone, what are you doing? You are going, you are, you are uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You are uh, locking in, if you wish, to some evil in that person and trying to get them to compromise themselves. Seduction, a temptation, some evil within the person, lust or greed or whatever, right? Well, this is not what is happening to Jesus. He's without sin, he has no sin. There's nothing in him to appeal to, okay? So Jesus is being examined. That's the test. He's being, ex you know, you, when you go to school, you're having a, a test, he would, okay? So Jesus was being tested. He was being examined concerning sin. You know, Jesus, God's son, could not fail in being able to resist sin, but he had to experience the suffering that goes along with the test. He was tested and examined like we are, Hebrews 4 verse 15. So there was a physical test, 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. There's the hunger and the weakness the loneliness, the beasts. Then there's the, the moral test, confrontation with Satan. Now someone says, well, if Jesus couldn't fail, why the test? Perfectly good question. Well, the test is to prepare Jesus to be our high priest. Hebrews 4, verse 4 to 14 to 16, to be our intermediary. By virtue of his experience, Jesus could be the perfect representative for man. By virtue of his sinlessness, he could also be the perfect sacrifice. And then by virtue of his experience, he could perfectly sympathize with men's problems. 
the Lord understands what it's like to be weak and hungry and tired, you know, and so on and so forth, and then face an exam, a test, a temptation, a moral dilemma. He understands that. Okay. So in verse 13, B, it said, oh, the physical test, sorry, uh, yeah. there we go. Um, God ministers to him after the testing uh, is over. I didn't read that. Uh, they uh, provide food. He really suffered physically. He needed the food. And the angels are there. He suffered emotionally and spiritually and he required the company of other beings who understood his ordeal. He, you know, he doesn't have any apostles yet, no disciples, He's, his family doesn't get it. He's all by himself. And so the angels are there to comfort him. So a couple of things, Jesus' temptation offers you know, a, a couple of good lessons for us in our Christian walk. The first one is um, be careful. You know, be careful when you get to a peak spiritually. We're especially vulnerable after a spiritual or physical or emotional peak. For example, Jesus' baptism was a peak, was a high point in the beginning of His ministry. And pride would be a danger. Okay? We are also uh, vulnerable uh, when we're in the valleys as well. You know, we're sick, tired, suffering. Jesus had fasted for 40 days. Discouragement can be a danger. You know, uh, <laughs> you overcome some temptation or some trial or you've, you, you've, you've worked hard in serving or ministry, you know, and you're wrapping it up and it's been a great success. Right at that moment, you're usually vulnerable. Right at that moment, you're on the top of the world. You know, that's <laughs> a very, very dangerous moment. But then again, down in the valley, you're tired, you're, you know, you're vulnerable to discouragement, to sorrow, to quitting. Also, uh, when tested, we need to immediately rely on God and His word for help and, and safety. You know, don't trust your own wisdom. Jesus does provide a way of escape. Jesus does provide a way to deal uh, with the temptation, with the test. A lot of people think that the only way that Jesus will deal with a test that you're facing is by removing the test. You know, like if you're sick, the only way he, you, know, you think He's going to deal with it is that He's going to make you better. Or if you're lonely, the only way that He's going to deal with that is find you somebody so that you're not lonely anymore. Well, yeah, that is a solution, but that's not the only solution. You know, sometimes he's able to help, well, he's always able, but sometimes what he'll do is enable you to be lonely without being discouraged, without being in despair. Or if you're ill, the illness persists, but somehow you have the strength to bear, to bear with it. Okay? Also, um, be prepared. Jesus was prepared for his ministry through trial and testing, and so are we. You know, don't get mad, don't be impatient, discouraged. Let the test work on you in order to help you become perfected. It's necessary to go through trials to show our faith. Very hard to witness for your faith when you're on, the, on top of the mountain. It's usually when you're down in the valley that you're best witness for your faith. And actually, it's when you're in the valley that other people are impressed by your faith. You know, when you've got it all, your kids are healthy, everyone's happy, got a great marriage, you know, money in the bank, you know, your car's functioning properly. You know what I'm saying? There's no witness there. Where's the witness? No witness. Unless you say, thank you God, well okay. It's when things are, you know, it's when the roof caves in and when there's trouble. That's when people are paying attention to how you deal with that stuff. That's where your witness becomes uh, powerful. And then of course, remember, the Lord does provide. He does provide for you during and after the trial if you, lean on, if you lean on Him. So Mark introduces Jesus in just a few verses and he establishes Him as a divine being. Uh, he arrives according to prophecy. At His baptism there is a supernatural sign of His identity. In the desert He demonstrates His power over sin. 
and then he receives ministry and communes with the angels. Well, I don't know about you, but that, that's a lot of evidence pointing to this person being someone rather special. So at this point, there's no doubt in the reader's mind as to the nature of Jesus and what Mark is saying about him. He said in verse one, remember I told you, Jesus, the divine Son of God, and now he's going to go about proving it. Okay. So now we're going to move on to Jesus' divinity proven through miracles and teaching. Jesus Himself will establish His divine authority by announcing the time and the terms of salvation. Imagine, who's got, who other than God has the right to determine when and how people are going to be saved? Who other than God has the right to say to people, this is how you go to heaven? <laughs> so, this part of Mark, Jesus begins to do that. So let's, uh, let's keep on reading Mark 1. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Again, notice Mark, I mean four or five words talking about John the Baptist. He, he talked about John the Baptist and now it says, okay, he's in prison and he just keeps rolling along. You know. It doesn't spend any time, no details, no details. So here the key is, what's he preaching? So John preached, prepare, the time is coming. Jesus preached, the time is now. That's the difference in their preaching. So the term fulfilled equals you know, a cup is filled to the brim. And so Jesus begins to preach, the time is now, after John the Baptist is arrested. That's the point that Mark is making. The core of his message was, now the kingdom of God is at hand and salvation is at hand. And the response to him and his message at that time, belief, verse 15, repentance, verse 15, and then baptism, John chapter four, verse one and two. That's how people were responding to Jesus' preaching. They believed him, they repented, because that was the message, the kingdom is at hand, repent. And people were being baptized. Jesus carries on John the Baptist's ministry of baptizing believers. All right, so today the message is fuller, it has more details, but essentially the, pretty much the same. Now is the, you know, what do we say? Now is the time to be saved? And the response pretty much the same, isn't it? In 2016, people who hear the message, how do they respond? They believe, Mark 16, 16. They repent, Acts 2, 37, 38. They're baptized in the name of Jesus, Acts 2, 37, 38. Hasn't changed. We mentioned that young, that young teenage boy. He was baptized this week. Mike Coghill baptized him this week sometime. He did exactly the same thing that, uh, but how long you been a Christian? 50 years, 60 years, even more. I didn't know you were that old, but anyways. So, you know, so 70 years ago, this brother you know, became a Christian. How did he do it? Well, he believed and he repented and he was baptized. And so fast forward 70 years, a young preteen out there, he wants to become a Christian. How does he do it? Exactly the same way. Nothing has changed, okay? So Jesus establishes his authority by announcing that salvation is possible, it is at hand, and he also establishes what the proper response is going to be. This is what you have to do. Verses 16 to 20. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Now remember, Mark is recording Peter's recollections of his life with Jesus, and so here he briefly describes his call along with his brother and other local fishermen who were called, it's amazing, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know, we, we, we mystify the calling of all the apostles. I mean, they were neighbors. Some of them were his relatives, cousins. You know. Well, who else would he call? <laughs> People he knew. 
people who had followed him already for a time. So there are different stages you know, in the call of Jesus. This wasn't Peter's first contact with the Lord. For example, this is, you know, I'm not going to read the passages, but I'll give you the pattern. So there's a general call to discipleship, and an example of that is in John 1, 35 to 42. Here, uh, the first contact with G Peter has his first contact with Jesus uh, while he and his brother were uh, disciples of John the Baptist. So they were disciples of John the Baptist first, and then they heard about Jesus. And so Jesus begins to teach them personally, first as disciples. Next stage, Jesus calls Peter to a specific ministry here in Mark 1, 17. The verb follow means to follow closely with a desire to find or to make a search. At first, he follows to be edified and to be taught. Now, he invites Peter to search him to find out who he really is. In searching and finding who Jesus is, meaning he finds out that Jesus is divine, Peter will become a fisher of men. So Peter and the others will want to tell others about Jesus' divinity, and of course they did. And then, third stage, Jesus confirms the call. We read about this in Luke chapter five. Jesus performs a miracle in Peter's own boat. And this elicits a confession of faith in Jesus' divinity, because Peter then calls him Lord. You know, Get away from me, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm not worthy of you. And now this time, they don't just leave their boats, they leave everything behind to follow. So it isn't that Jesus is walking along, sees Peter for the very first time and says, hey you, come follow me. No. Now Peter followed John the Baptist and you know, heard the teaching and then John the Baptist points to Jesus and so now he's listening to Jesus and it, you know, he sees them, he's around, he knows who he is, so on and so forth. And then one day Jesus says, hey, I, I need your boat, I need to teach the people, come on, let's get in the boat. Okay, sure, you know, and they go to the boat and he teaches the people. And then Jesus said, well, let's, let's go get some fish. And Peter says, oh, you know, we, we tried to fish all night, didn't work, you know, we're tired, you know, it's time to go home. You know. But because you say so, because you know, he's been listening to Jesus now for a while, because you say so, okay, sure, out of respect. And what happens, right? He catches this huge, huge you know, catch of fish. Then all of a sudden, he starts putting together everything that John the Baptist said, and you know how it is, you have all the information, and then one day it all kind of snaps together and the light goes on? Well, in, the, in Peter's boat, the miracle of the fish that he catches, all of a sudden it all snaps together. Oh, wait a minute, you are, oh, you're the Messiah. <laughs> oh, and you're here in my boat. Oh, Lord, I. I'm not worthy of you, please. You know, I'm a sinner. And so what does Jesus say? Well, it's okay. I'll make you a fisher of men. So it's gradual, just like it's gradual for us. We, we didn't become Christians the first day we heard the gospel. Very rarely happens that way. So some people follow Jesus because his teachings are good. Others follow because they are followers and Jesus is as good or a better leader than others, and then the apostles and all the disciples, they follow Jesus because they've come to believe that He is the divine Son of God who does have power. So now uh, you know, we begin the section where Jesus will demonstrate His divinity through a series of teachings and miracles. And so Mark, in his style, he alternates between these two aspects in his narrative on Jesus' life. So we go to chapter uh, or verse 21 and 22 where he, he lists a teaching, for, he starts with a teaching. So he says, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So his teaching in the synagogue was basically what is contained in verse 15. The kingdom is now, okay, always the same message. Mark records their reaction. They were amazed. It means they were struck by the extraordinariness and the unexpectedness of something. 
And this is always the effect of Jesus' teaching to the people. In Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, and in John 7, 46, the soldiers, you know, they couldn't arrest him because they were amazed. They said, why didn't you arrest this guy? Well, nobody ever spoke like him. We, we, we were dumbfounded. We couldn't arrest this guy. So they were not amazed at his style or his delivery. They were amazed at the content and that he taught with power of authority. In other words, he knew what he was talking about. Now you have to understand, the style of the rabbis at the time was to argue back and forth, quoting other rabbis in order to make their point. There was a topic, and one would say, well, according to Rabbi Hillel, blah, 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 blah. And then the, the, the other rabbi said, yes, but a Rabbi so-and-so, well, he said this. Well, another, you know, they were always referring other people back and forth, right? But Jesus said, you know, on the question, is it really sinful to carry two sticks on the Sabbath? The <laughs> two rabbis would go back and forth. Is it a sin to carry two sticks on the Sabbath? Is that really work or not? So what does Jesus say? Jesus says, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Boom, <laughs> argument closed. So he brought a higher and deeper and truer insight and thus spoke with power. So then you know, we go to another, so, so Mark, the way he lays out his, 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 his script, the teaching, then he follows with miracles, verses 23 to 44, not going to read all that, we don't have time. So the powerful teaching is now followed by a, a demonstration of five powerful miracles. First, the casting out of an unclean spirit. Now, an unclean spirit is a demon, you know, one without purity. The spirit speaks, the man is controlled by the spirit, gives us insight into demons. They have personality because it, you know, we see the demon express itself. It has intelligence, the demon knows about Jesus. It has power because it possesses the man. A demon has will because he wanted something. So Jesus refuses to accept the testimony of the demon because demons are unworthy to do it. Some people say that. Why wouldn't Jesus let the demons talk? They're saying he's the Lord, they say he's Jesus because they're not worthy to make that. You know what I'm saying? They're not worthy to speak his name. That's why he tells the demon, no, you be quiet. And also, if demons you know, say who Jesus is, that confuses the people. You know, I mean, people would be confused if the demons are talking about Jesus. Well, no, I mean, wait a minute, is he good or bad? The demons are talking about him. So in this, uh, in this uh, healing where he casts out an unclean spirit of the man, we notice, if we had time to read it, he does this with just a command. No incantations, no potions, no lights, no yelling, no manipulation, no bargaining. You know, do you really, really believe? He just said, come out of him. Boom, that's the end of that. It's like the military, right? Do generals yell? No, four-star generals don't yell, why? They have power and they know they have power. They, they just say, yeah, this goes here, you go there, right? Corporals yell. They don't have a lot of power. <laughs> so the people are amazed. It's the same reaction as the teaching. They're amazed because he teaches with power. They're amazed because he defeats the most vicious demons with just a command. Um, uh, casting out spirits. Let me just go ahead here. Uh, he heals Peter's mother-in-law, for example. You know, Peter's a married man. The woman is very sick. When he heals her, the Bible says, Immediately she got up and began serving them, meaning the healing was complete. Um, we read about him uh, healing all of the people that would come to Peter's house, for example. A very short description here, he just says all these people were coming and he was healing them of all kinds of diseases. Mark doesn't even bother listing the diseases. And then um, in the next uh, section here, um, and verses 35 to 39, we see uh, more teaching and the confirmation of 
uh, more miracles. The teaching to establish his identity and requirements, the miracles to confirm his authority and power. So he teaches and people are going, wow, that's really good. You know, then he does a miracle. Well, why is the miracle there? Well, to confirm the teaching, to confirm the teaching. And then of course, in verse 40 to 45, he, um, let me go there, he heals the leper. Now, leprosy was an incurable disease. It was physically debilitating in various stages where the skin and the body parts you know, have sores, they dry up and they, they fall off. It was socially crippling as well. You weren't allowed in the temple. It was a total life of quarantine. It was hard to put a, you had to put your hand over your mouth whenever you were in public and say, you know, unclean, unclean, nobody could come near you by mistake. So this man comes to Jesus to be healed had great faith in Jesus' power. And Jesus touches him, which wasn't allowed, and the man is healed, healed. He heals his disease, but he also heals his self-esteem as well. So Jesus tells him to ha have his healing confirmed and certified by the priests first, without revealing how it happened. This was the law. The priests would give permission to the person who was healed to kind of go back to temple worship. In other words, it was your way of kind of getting a certificate saying you're healed, you can now go back to your ordinary life, back to temple worship, back to normal social interactions. But if, if we read this passage, you'd see the man was so excited that he couldn't wait and he created a stir among the public to the extent that Jesus could no longer go into heavily populated areas or else he'd be mobbed by people who wanted healing. So Jesus has established himself as one who speaks with authority and who demonstrates power. The people are now coming to him to see him and to hear him. Okay, so in the next sections that we're going to cover, we're going to see Jesus continue this demonstration, but now what Mark is going to do is he's going to begin recording the opposition. So far, no opposition. You know, they're like, they're like a train, you know, they're just uh, going down the track, teaching, healing, you know, everyone's amazed. But next, in our next lesson, we're going to see, okay, now the opposition starts to come and we'll see the conflict beginning to, uh, to come about as well. Okay, so that's our lesson for this time. Thank you very much for your attention.